We're going to talk about the end times, what's going to happen in the end of the world, so to speak. Now, there's at least a thousand and seven years ahead of us on the earth. The earth is going to at least be here for another thousand and seven years. It'll be in different dispensations, but it'll be here. But what leads us up to the end times? What? Who are the players in the end time? Who, who are these uh, armies that are going to grow to the Great War? And uh, uh, the Book of Islam, the Islamic uh, writings, the, the, the Quran, the Hadith, all of these writings talk about a lot of eschatology, end times. But everything in Islamic end times that's good is bad in the Bible, and that everything that's bad in Islam is good in the Bible. So we have two opposite things. Now the Bible is the earliest revelation, and the Bible has proved itself already that it's true. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible has already proved itself to be true. Islam... <coughs> According to Muhammad, there are seven earths. Now, there aren't seven earths, are there? Now, we know that we've been out in space, we take pictures, there aren't seven earths. Uh, according to, to Muhammad, you know, flies carry disease, don't they? They carry disease. Well, Muhammad, he was asked about flies, what do you do when a fly lands in your drink or in your food? So he said, well, a fly on one wing is poison and the other wing is an antidote to the poison. So what you do is the fly lands in your drink, you just take and dip the whole fly in the drink and you'll have the antidote to the poison. Now we know that that's not true, don't we? That is hogwash, that is mythology, that is superstition. Now, Muhammad had a, a formula and a rule for everything. How many times you wipe yourself when you go to the bathroom, where you point yourself when you go to the bathroom, uh, <clears throat> about sex and about everything. He had rules for everything. Now, according to Muhammad, the man's sperm comes from his backbone. It's a fluid in the backbone. Now, we know that that's not true, don't we? <laughs> Medically, that's wrong. A woman, uh, <clears throat> a woman's uh, genital fluids that came from her breasts, he said. That's not true. That's not true at all. These are some things. He said that the sun set in a muddy pond. We know that the sun does not set in a muddy pond, don't we? He said the earth was flat. The earth is flat. We know that the earth is not flat, don't we? He said God put mountains on the earth to keep the earth from blowing away. Because the earth is like a big carpet, and he had to put mountains here and there to hold the earth down when the wind blows so it wouldn't blow the earth away like a big carpet or sheet. These are things that Muhammad taught his people to believe. Now, according to them, the Hadiths and the Sunnahs are absolute facts. And the Quran is the Word of God, and there all of it is right over there, as you can see. It's there. All of that from there to there is Islam. And all of the writings. And if you look at the books I've written, I've written all over them. So I read them, didn't I, Mary? She always took, picked up a book and she said, well, you read this book, as you can see right here. There's writing all over it. Now, we know medically that Muhammad is wrong. We know that scientifically that Muhammad is wrong. We know that the Bible is right medically and the Bible is right scientifically. If we try to twist the Bible to say something that the Bible doesn't say, we may be wrong. But the Bible's still right. All your scientific terms come from Greek. Your medical terms, your scientific terms come from Greek. 
your legal terms come from Latin because the Catholic Church was in power uh, ruling the world and their language of the Bible at that time that they took the Bible out of the hands of the people from Greek and Hebrew and put it in Latin. We know that uh, that's why that we have the legal terms in Latin. Now I want to read a little bit of some history here. <clears throat> we looked at Daniel the seventh chapter and Daniel the second chapter. Now let's look and, and, and just see what some historical figures said about Islam. We set up a president before that Islam in the end times, that Islam is a player in the end times. The Bible says that the beast and the false prophet and the Antichrist is going to come from a certain religious entity and we can identify that as Islam. Now, Islam has said that the Bible is inaccurate and the Bible cannot be trusted. Well, all the devils always says that. We prove that Islam and the Quran and Muhammad were farces and that the Bible is true scientifically and historically, but Islam is wrong. You can take and burn all the Bibles all day long and you won't be in trouble. But if you take one Quran and publicly burn the Quran, you're going to be in trouble from now on. There will probably be a fact walk on you, a death sentence. John Wesley said, Indeed, the iron teeth closely match Islam. Ever since the religion of Islam appeared in the world, the espousers of it have been wolves and tigers to all other nations, rending and tearing all that fell into their merciless paws and grinding them with iron teeth, and numberless cities are raised from the foundation, only their name remaining that many countries which were once the garden of God, are now desolate wildernesses, and that is so many more once numerous and powerful nations are vanished from the earth. Such was and is to this day the rage, the fury, and the revenge of these destroyers of humankind and other religious forms. In 1938, Haley Balak said, Will not perhaps the temporal power of Islam will return and with it a menace of armed Mohammedan world which will shake off the dominion of the European still nominally Christian and reappear as the prime enemy of civilization? The future always comes as a surprise, but political wisdom consists in attempting to at least some partial judgment of what that surprise may be, for my part I cannot but believe that it may, the main expectation is the future and the return of Islam as a power in the world. A Catholic priest by the name of uh, Fulton Sheen, and I have his book right up there, that one, <coughs> In 1950, the hatred of the Muslim world countries against the West is becoming a hatred against Christianity itself. Although the statesmen have not yet taken it into account, there is still grave danger that the temporal power of Islam may return, and with it the menace that it may shake off the West, which is, has ceased to be Christian and affirm itself as a great anti-Christian world and power. In 1354, Gregory Palamas of Thessalonica said, For these impious people, hatred by God and infamous, boast of having got the better of the Romans by their love of God. They live by the bow, by the bow and the sword and debauchery, finding pleasure in taking slaves, devoting themselves to murder, pillage, and so on. And not only they commit these crimes, but even... What an aberration they believe that God approves of their crimes. Jesus said, the time will come when whosoever kills you will think that he does God a service. John 16 and 2.
Vernon Richards said, the true Islamic concept of peace something like this. Peace comes through submission to Islam and to Muhammad and his concept of all. As such, the Islamic concept of peace, meaning making the whole world Muslim, is exactly the mandate for war. It was inevitable and unavoidable that the conflict would eventually reach our borders, and so has. This is Islam's latest attempt to conquer the infidel world, and why do you suppose that they waited until three centuries after the siege of the Battle of Vienna before they tried again? Was it because they saw an opportunity to get off after us for the first time in 1683? Because political correctness and the apologies it brought in trained softened us up and made us totally unaware of how evil and intolerant Islam really is and give them the window of opportunity to once again threaten our civilization with doom. In 1840, Josiah Litch said this, In his fall of the Ottoman Roman Empire, Litch predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire two years in advance of the exact day. He also interpreted the star of Revelation as ushering in Islam. A star in the figurative language of Revelation is the minister of religion. Revelation 1 and 20. A fallen star then would signify a fallen heretical minister of religion, and of course we know it's talking about Satan also. This was undoubtedly the Arabian imposter Muhammad. There is so general an agreement among Christians, especially Protestant commentators, that the subject of this prediction is Muhammadism or Islam. Sir Robert Anderson if you do not know who Sir Robert Anderson is, he is the one that made up a lot of the biblical, uh, uh, what we might call chronology, and the book of Daniel, and his interpretation of the time. Sir Robert Anderson had a whole lot to do with the um, Jack the Ripper also in England. Perhaps one of the leading scholars of prophecy was unlocked the 70 weeks of Daniel in verse 7 indicates that the rise of these kingdoms was future. And he continues in the history of Babylonia, there is nothing to correspond with the predicted course of the first beast, for it is scarcely legitimate to suppose that the vision of prophecy was of the career of Nebuchadnezzar. Neither is there in the history of Persia anything answering to the bear-like beast with a precision and fullness which prophecy demands. The Bible says something, it states it. Believe it and interpret it literally as much as you can. The language of the English version suggests a reference to Persia and Media, but the true meaning renders to be it made for itself one dominion instead of it, it raised itself up on one side. Anderson says, even today this bear is rising in a lopsided fashion, we have Iran, Persia, rising without media, Kurdistan. Anderson continues, while the symbolism of the sixth verse seems to, at first sight, to be the point to the Grecian Empire, it will appear upon a closer examination that it is an event of the leopard had four wings and four heads. This was primarily a normal condition. It was this condition that dominion was given to it, and this surely from a different form and single power, which in its decadence continued to exist in a divided state. Alexander the Great had four generals. And those four generals divided his empire, and then the Roman Empire took over that. Each of the three first empires of the second chapter of Babylon, Persia, and Greece was in turn destroyed by a successor. But the kingdoms of the seventh chapter all continued together upon the scene through the dominion was with the fourth Daniel, 7 and 12. This verse seems to imply that the four beasts came up together and that all events there is nothing to suggest a series of empires such as destroying its predecessor through the symbolism of the version in contrast with that 
admirably adapted to this present time. The writer here says Anderson is correct. Today we see the three kingdoms rising to power, Iraq, Babylon, Iran, Persia, without media, and Turkey, Ionia, Greece. They are all rising together and all symbolically and historically connected to the empires that Daniel predicted. Expect the bear, Iran, to consume the three ribs which may be splintering into Iraq into three sectors. Concerning the Roman Empire, Anderson said it must be it must be owned that there was nothing in history of ancient Rome to correspond with the main characteristics of the fourth beast unless the symbolism used is is to be very loosely interpreted. To devour the earth, tread it down and break it to pieces is fairly descriptive of other empires, but ancient Rome was precisely the one power that added the government to conquest, and instead of treading down and breaking into pieces the nations it subdued, he sought rather to mold them into his own civilizations and polity and to make them part of the great empire. The vision of the seventh chapter must be of some future reference. Anderson said that uh, speaking of the end times empires that exist simultaneously, amazing that he stated that the Middle East would be the primary area of the conflict. When the Bible say uh, Gog and Magog, he's not talking about Russia, he's talking about Turkey. He's talking about Asia Minor. Cyril over Jerusalem in 315 to 386 A.D. Amazingly, before the advent of Islam, there were those that looked toward the Middle East for fulfillment of the Antichrist prophet. Cyril was distinguished theologian and a father in the early churches. Cyril discusses the fact that the Antichrist will proceed forth from a region of ancient Syria, which extended from modern-day Syria well into the ports of Asia Minor or Turkey. A king shall arise out of Syria born from an evil spirit, and we know that the Bible says in Genesis 3.15 that Satan will bring forth a literal child. Satan will sperm forth a literal child. And this evil spirit will be the overthrower and destroyer of the human race, and he shall destroy that which is left by the formal evil together with himself. But that king will not only be most disgraceful in himself, but he will also be a prophet of lies, and he will constitute and call himself God, and will order himself to be worshipped as the Son of God, and the power will be given unto him to do signs and wonders, by the side of which they may entice men to adore him. And we know that Satan can work miracles. Go back to the book of Genesis, or Exodus that is, where Satan worked miracles in Egypt. And they will attempt to destroy the temple of God and persecute the righteous people. The Antichrist will come from the Middle East. So for Aeneas, Patriarch of Jerusalem, 560-638, was an Arab Christian who became the Patriarch of Jerusalem in 634 and remained so until his death four years later. 634 now, if you look in Islam, Muhammad was born in 570 A.D. By 632, by 634, he had declared war on the world. Even then? Then. In 632, he declared war on the world and said to go out and conquer until all of them submit to Islam and to my name as a prophet. The patriarch used him in 634 and remained so until his death four years later. It was during these years that the Muslim armies under Caliph Umar invaded and conquered Jerusalem several 
historical references attest to the fact that Sophronius identified the Muslim occupation of Jerusalem as the Temple Mount as a fulfillment of the abomination, the abomination that caused desolation, that it was always associated with the coming of the Antichrist. So Frenus laments to the circumstances under which the church in Jerusalem found itself and refers to the Muslim occupiers as being followers of Satan. Why are the troops of Sassus, the Saracens attacking us? Why has there been so much des destruction and plunder? Why are there insisting outpourings of human blood? Why are the birds of the sky devouring human bodies? And why have churches been pulled down? And why has the cross been mocked? Why is Christ, who is the dispenser of all good things and the provider of his joyous, uh, joyousness of ours, blasphemed by pagan mouths? The vengeful and God-hating Saracens, the abomination and desolation clearly foretold to us by the prophets overrun the, the places which are now allowed them, plunder cities, devastate fields, burn down villages, set on fire holy churches, overturn sacred monasteries, moreover, they are raised up more and more against us and increase their blasphemy of Christ, and they do. The Muslim world blasphemes Christ because he says that he was not the Son of God. And the utter wicked blasphemy is against God. The God fighters boast of prevailing over all assiduously and unrestrainedly admitting or imitating their leader who is the devil and emulating his vanity because of which he has been expelled from heaven and been assigned to the gloomy shades of hell. Now, a lot of these people that I'm quoting are Catholic fathers, but they saw something coming upon them at that time. When Muhammad was born, if he was born in 570 A.D., all of Damascus in that area and much of Arabia was Christianized. But Muhammad went out killing Christians from the very beginning and denouncing Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That the absolute confession of Islam is there is no God but Allah and he has no companion. In other words, there is no Jesus. There is no Son of God. And Muhammad is his messenger. That is a proclamation of Islam. Now, Maximus the Confessor, 580 to 662, now he lived during the time of the Muslim world, the conquering. He described the invading Muslims as a people who delight in human blood. They delight in spilling human blood. They, it, today, you can watch on the, on the internet them beheading Christians and oh, people. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. watch it every day and the blood flows and they delight in it. Yeah, yeah. A people who delight in human blood whom God hates, though they think they are worshiping God, he who also referred to the Muslim invasions as announcing the event of the Antichrist. And so we see that even in the early period of church history, we see Islam's growth as a clear association with the Antichrist. John of Damascus, 676 to 749. He was born into a privileged Christian family in Syria. <coughs> but later became presbyter and monk. His grandfather had been the administrator of Damascus at the time the Muslims took it, and he actually grew up and served in the court of the Caliph. He was thoroughly familiar with the Islam and what they teach. And thus, in his famous book, Against Heresies, he devotes a whole chapter to the discussion of Islam. A whole chapter to the discussion of Islam. Donald Grewar is texting me from uh, Wales at this time. <laughs> and there is also up until now strong and people deceiving superstition among the Ishmaelites. 
that is the forerunner of the Antichrist. And this superstitious Islam is born of Ishmael, who was born from Hagar to Abraham, which they are called Hagarenes and Ishmaelites. And they call them Caesareans, those empty of Sarah, because of what is said by Hagar to the angel, Sarah has sent me away empty. So then these were idolaters, reverence the morning star and Aphrodite. The morning star and Aphrodite, they, the moon, the crescent moon, the morning star. The morning star, they believe, is that cobblestone that fell out of heaven, which is the right hand of Allah. All it is is a meteorite that they worship in Mecca. It's called in, in uh, uh, Greek and Rome, Aphrodite. Whom they indeed main Akbar in their own language, which means great. And therefore, until the time of Heraclius, they were plainly idolaters. From which time until now, they came up then with a false prophet called Muhammad, who having encountered the Old and New Testament, as it seems, having Converse with an Arian monk. An Arian monk was one that believed that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. Arianism. Put together his own heresy. Even as early as 50 years after Islam was birthed, learned Christian leaders who were familiar with Islam were referring to it as the forerunner of the Antichrist. The Muslim invaders heralded the advent of Antichrist. Interestingly, we see John of Damascus according to Islam as a Christian heresy connected with a Aryan monk. And his connection with Aphrodite and the moon goddess. It is proven archaeologically by early Islamic coins that they worshipped this Aphrodite or the moon goddess. In the 9th century, that's 1000 A.D., The many Christians from Cordoba, Spain were martyred during what is called, uh, ironically, the peaceful existence between Christian and Muslims in the Islamic rule of Europe under the Caliph. They murdered Christians. In the 850s in Andalusian Spain, most Christians seem to have assumed a position of quiet submission to Muslim rule turning their heads to the daily inequality suffered by Christians at the hands of the Muslim overlords. They were remained a remnant of faithful Christians who refused to submit to the status quo of silence. During this time, well over 50 Christians were put to death for proclaiming and confessing that they believed Muhammad to be a false prophet and the per per precursor of the Antichrist. Six Christians were called before the authorities asked to recant their denial of Muhammad as a true prophet, and the six refiled, we abide by the same confession. O judge that our most holy brothers, Isaac and Sanchez professed, now hand down the sentence, multiply your cruelty, be kindled with complete fury and vengeance for your prophet. We profess Christ to be truly God, and your prophet to be precursor of Antichrist and an author of profane doctrine. It is wonderful that we see such great faith and bravery among the early Christians. Two people that defended the martyrs and monks named Eulogius and Paul Avaras. Eulogius later martyred as well and praised the Christians who said they marched out against the angel of Satan and the forerunner of the time of Christ and this is Muhammad the heresiarch. Paul of Alvarez went on further to say in writing in his book that Muhammad was a forerunner of the Antichrist and the 11th horn of Daniel. Martin Luther, now we know what the Lutheran, about Luther and, and Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546 was of course the German monk who became the father of the Protestant Reformation. He was a Catholic that became a Christian. He was reading, he was, he was a Catholic priest, a Catholic priest that became a Christian. Mm -hmm. He read the Bible and it led him to believe in faith in Christ by, without a priest. He, didn't, he lost his job as far as he's concerned. He, didn't, he couldn't confess 
somebody couldn't confess to him and he could denounce them clean? He said, that's between God and man only. You learned that, Bob. <laughs> you pray to Jesus now, through Jesus to the Father. You don't have to go to any priest. And that's what Martin Luther, the priest, realized, but he wanted to reform the Catholic Church and bring it back to the Bible. It almost cost him his death. Well, uh... Luther became the view as the Roman Catholic papacy of the seat of the Antichrist. But few are aware that he also taught that the Muslim people, which we refer to as the Turks, comprise the eastern segment of the Antichrist kingdom. And we know that, that Islam and Catholicism are beginning to line up today. The Pope will not denounce Islam. He said the Pope is the spirit of the Antichrist, the Turk Muslim is the flesh of the Antichrist. They help each other in their murderous work. The later slaughters bodily by the sword and the former spiritually by doctrine. The Catholic Church murders by doctrine and Islam murders by the sword. I spent this almost this whole lesson telling you what, what people said about Islam. People that lived in, in history. John Calvin determined that the Antichrist kingdom would, would confess consist of both the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Ottoman Muslim Empire. To Calvin, the Catholic Church, and listen, were equally deserving the title of Antichrist. Now John Calvin was a Dominican preacher. He was, he, he was a Dominican preacher. He preached in Dominican churches. He was a Dominican priest. He was never ordained by the Catholic Church, but he worked and served as a priest. And he kept preaching, and he told them that the doctrine of the Eucharist was the doctrine of hell. And he told them that the, the Lord's Supper was no more than a memorial, remembering the death, that the wafer didn't become the body of Christ, and the, and the wine did not become his blood. That it was heresy. He said, as Muhammad says that his Quran is the, is the sovereign wisdom, so the Pope says that his own decrees, for they are both two horns of the Antichrist, John Calvin said. Elaborating on the prophecy of, Cal of Daniel 7, Calvin commented, it does not seem that the fourth iron kingdom was in fact both the pre-papal and the pre-Islamic undivided pagan Roman Empire, as well as the later Western Roman Papal and contemporaneous Eastern Roman Islamic Empire into which they can be subdivided. Thus they correspond to the two legs of the Roman Empire, Islam and the papacy. Referring to the great Antichrist Apostle Calvin again pointed his finger at both the religion of Islam and the Catholic Church. The defection of apostasy has indeed spread more wildly, for since Muhammad was an apostate, he turned to his followers, the Turks, from Christ, and the sect of Muhammad was like a raging overflow, which in, in its violence tore away about half of the church. It remained for the papal antichrist to infect with his poison the part that was left. So we have Islam and we have the Catholic, the Catholic Church poisoned by doctrine, poisoning the people by doctrine and heresy, and we have Islam murdering people. And speaking of the Antichrist, Calvin said this, in Daniel 11, 37, the prophet predicted that the coming of a terrible tyrant, this is how the described that tyrant, neither shall he pay regard to the God of his fathers, nor to the desire of women, applied to the Unitarian Muslims, Muslims, this might well mean that they ignore the Trinitarian God of their forefathers and with their licentious and polygamy also disregard the desire of women to conclude a monogamous relationship and union. The love of women seems to give popular probability to this view for Muhammad allowed to his men the brutal liberty of chastising their wives, beating them, and then sometimes killing them. He allowed his men 
when they went out to, to fight, to rape and pillage the women. One time these men came to him and said, hey, these women are very important people, and these people are very important people, and maybe their men, their husbands will want to ransom them back, and should we, we're going to rape them, like you say, we can rape them, but should we withdraw before we plant seed in them? Should we, because maybe if they're impregnated with us, their, their husbands and their fathers and their families won't want them to ransom them. And he said, just go ahead and have your way with them. If uh, all the wills, they'll get pregnant. If he doesn't, they won't. How do you condone rape in a religion? How do you condone rape in a religion? We know that the Catholic Church, that the Catholic armies raped and pillaged and stole. We know that. How can you condone rape and pillage with the Word of God? How can you do that? Muhammad corrupted the communal love and fidelity which binds the husband to the wife. Muhammad was full of lust. Muhammad had a whole bunch of wives. He said that he had the horsepower of 40 men, so therefore that Allah had granted him the, the, the right to have more than four wives. All the Muslims could have four wives, and all the concubines they can afford and, 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 and to support. Now the difference between a wife and a concubine is the concubine's children don't have any rights. The wife's children are heirs. Jonathan Edwards from 1703 to 1758. He was a great American congregational preacher and revivalist. He preached that great sermon, hands in the, ha uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. As he was the president of Princeton University, he became more and more close to the Bible and finally they denounced him as being going too far from their religions. He said that the Lord's Supper was nothing but a, a, a local church ordinance that was done in memory of Jesus Christ. He said that there shall be a spirit of popery, the spirit of Mohammedanism, Islam, and the spirit of heathenism all united in the end times referring to the false prophet in Revelation, the 13th chapter. Here an eye seems to be had that Muhammad, whom his followers called the prophet of God. Like most of the Reformed theologians that came before him, Edwards held to a historicist interpretation of the book of Revelation, that, in other words, that it had already happened, which was not right. He considered Revelation to be a treatise about the whole period from the birth of Christ to the conclusion of this age. He said that the Muslim army, Satan's uh, Muhammad kingdom, shall be utterly overthrown. The locusts and the horsemen in the ninth chapter of Revelation have their appointed time to set there, and the prophet shall be taken and destroyed. And then, though Muhammadism has been so vastly propagated into the world and is upheld by such a great empire, this smoke which shall ascend out of the bottomless pit shall utterly be scattered before the light and that glorious day, and the Mohammedan empire shall fall at the sound of the great trumpet which shall be blown. Muhammad, or, uh, Jonathan Edwards said that, that the words locust and Arab are almost identical in many verses in the Bible. The locust, the Arabs, come against Israel for battle, and the Arab word for locust is Gindib. The monolith Shalmanzer III from Kirkuk, the oldest account from Babylon, and the oldest document mentioning Arabs list Gindibu, Arabah, regarding Arabs and their territory called Gindabu. 
So Jonathan Edwards said that he thought that the Islamic Empire was that empire which would be an, a, a, a historical and a present literal kingdom of the Antichrist that we are going to face in the last time. Islam sends out settlers. Marilyn and I have been going up in the hills the last few days, hunting a little bit and looking around. She's had a good time, haven't you? We went up there and we found buildings, old buildings that were here in the early 1800s. Where was this? In the early 1800s. Where? Which? Right up in, uh, in, oh, really? uh, up in the Chattavish Creek and, and uh, Davis Canyon, the Davis Canyon. Uh, in the 1870s here, uh, Asa Wiles was a, uh, a freighter. He carried freight by wagons. And he was, his farm, his stage coach depot and everything were right there at uh, where, the, where the, the cemetery is, on this side of the cemetery. That was Asa Wilde's area. And Asa Wilde uh, was shipping, and he had a wife, an Indian wife, and they were coming from Lida, and they came down here, and he had won a bunch of money from these people up there in Lida in a card game, and they followed him home because they knew that he had money. And they proceeded to uh, siege him. And there were five of them against one man. Asa Wiles was a pretty good gun fighter. And he killed all five of them, but he had been wounded. And so he died of his wounds. And they buried him all there together in this rock wall cemetery area. You'll see Asa Wiles and all the men that he killed. And his wife married Davis in Davis Canyon, which was a settler up there. And Marilyn and I went there yesterday, and out on the ground there, you'll see these square nails in that old building. Square nails go back into the early 1800s and the 1700s. Every nail back then was made by a blacksmith. They were all cut and shaped and formed. And so we picked up a few of those square nails and brought them, as these were early settlers in this area. The McAfee's, the Lighties, up in Cottonwood Creek, down at Oasis Ranch. A lot of these buildings were built in the early 1800s. Mm. And Davis, the Davis Ranch up there, uh, the old nails and the foundation of those homes were square nails. Mm. Now, these people are called settlers. Settlers came into Shoshone territory and they settled and took the land away from the Shoshone. I was here when Hank Patterson, uh, the one rancher here, was going to shove his houses over and his buildings that had been there for a hundred years and they were going to take over and just run him off his property, as Cord did in, in the Cord Ranch down there that was Indian villages out there and he took a, a bulldozer and just bulldozed them all over. This guy went down there to uh, Hank Patterson's house, and I knew him, he was like a father to me, and he looked upon me as a son. And this man picked up dirt and threw it in Hank's face, and he said, that's not your dirt, that's my dirt, to get off my land, get out of the way, we're going to shut these buildings over, and he said, no. My family had been here since history, the beginning of history. He said, this is my home, mm -hmm. I'm not leaving. Well, they kept insisting on shoving his little house down. He went over and Bishop got a lawyer and they found out that Hank Patterson owned the whole valley. The valley had never been treated for. And he made me his tribal hunter and I killed a lot of deer for them. The land had never been treated for. Islam goes in the nations. They will make treaties. But the treaty is a hudna. A treaty, a hudna treaty is you make a treaty with people and make peace with people until you become more powerful than they are and then you conquer them. The treaty peace is only a temporary peace. They go into countries and they make settlements. 
They call them settlers, and they go in and they, they build a mosque. And the mosque is sacred ground. The mosque is not in America, it is Islam. And they take this and they buy up whole neighborhoods around that wasp, around that mosque. And then they take over and they will not bow their knees to the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of any other government. They demand to be looked upon under Sharia law only. These are settlers. And in the world, this all over the world, <coughs> And just about every nation in the world, even in China, this is happening all over the world. Russia, England, Sweden, Netherlands, Denmark, every place they go, they're a scourge. And they take advantage and they kill. And they riot. We got democratic rioters. They're trying to make people so afraid to vote against their system. They're acting like Islam, aren't they? They're acting like Catholicism of old. We see all of this. Next verse, the next lesson, we're going to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to read that. This is what the world's got to face. This is what's coming in the end times. These settlers are becoming dominant. These settlers are becoming aggressive, rioters. People have been killed all over the world. Prominent people murdered because of Islam. Catholicism murdered people all over the world between 50 and 100 people. 50 and 100 million people. A lot of people. But Islam has murdered over 270 million people. And they've taken over these nations, and where if you live in those nations, you're either Islam or you're a uh, kafar. And a kafar has to pay jizya, protection money to stay alive. You know about the mafia? Well, Islam is like the mafia. Our Father, we send this message out to you. I pray that you touch people's lives with it, you let them see what's coming upon the world, and that you will help them to prepare for it. Father, forgive me where I fail you, and use your word and your message for your honor and your glory.